Hi, my name is Jessica, and thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come and be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. Let me start with a question. Who uh, has ever been to and swam in the ocean? All right, by far most of us here. Now, uh, let me ask another question. How many of you, when you go or have been to the ocean, you stay closer to the shore? Like you're not out there swimming past the buoy. You're like, all right, you know, one, two, three, four, five feet deep and I'm good. Anybody? Okay, that's me. I'll be honest. I'll admit, I'll, I'll, I'll be humbly honest here. Uh, if you were to ask me, hey, Michael, are you afraid of the ocean? I would say, no, not a chance in the world. Am I afraid of what's in the ocean? Potentially, yeah, a little bit, okay? Um, I've been to the ocean a, a, a couple times in the past few years, most recently with my, with my wife, but then also a few years ago, uh, we went to like a, a church conference thing, so with some of the guys on staff, we went. And like, I stay closer to the shore. Uh, Steven Spielberg, 50 years ago, made sure that we were all afraid of Jaws, right? And I've seen Shark Week. I know how that goes. I don't want to be on it. So I kind of stay close to, you know, land. I don't go, I don't mess with the deep blue sea. You, you can if you want. I stay close, all right? And you would think that because I'm close to the shore, I'm trying to say stay safe from all the creatures out there. But uh, even when we went with our staff, I got pooped on by a seagull. And I was like <laughs> close to the shore. So you would think I'd be safe. And you know where else that seagull could have pooped? Any of the other millions of square miles in the ocean, but no, it pooped on me. Anyway, that has nothing to do with this. But uh, I can't help when I'm in the ocean or when I'm even looking at it, when I'm swimming in the shore, like I can't help thinking about how big it is. Anybody else do that? Like you just realize how small you are, how wide it is, how deep it is. Uh, Google told me this week that over 90% of the ocean is still unexplored. It's wild to me. Like as smart and as technological as we are in 2024, by far the majority of it, we have no idea like what's, what's going on because of how big just in size it is. And even though there are things that I can't see, I can't really grasp the size of it, I can still enjoy it as I swim in the shallow part. And I start there because in a very similar way, uh, what we're gonna do with this series the gospel, the foundation of everything we do here, the truth that Jesus has died in our place for us, and he offers salvation through his life, death, and resurrection. That truth is everything we're about, but I can grasp that simple concept of, hey, Jesus died for me, he offers me eternal life, and I can enjoy the love and forgiveness of God, but... The gospel is also so profound that the greatest minds can't fully comprehend the depths of God's love for us. That um, this series, what we want to do is just go a little deeper into the greatest truth ever, into the gospel. One that we can spend a lifetime studying, but uh, it's also offered to every single one of us today. And becoming a Christian or becoming a disciple of Jesus is not just, hey, I'm saved, so I'm not going to hell. Like, it's not just a get out of hell free card and, all right, I'll see you after this life's over, Jesus. Thank you so much. It is so much more than that. There are things that happen to us immediately when we put our faith in Jesus. And then there are things that are uh, guaranteed to happen later. It's so much, maybe more than we think. And so the series is three weeks the deep end, three weeks, talking about what happens when we put our trust in Jesus. And this morning, we're talking about, uh, and, and these are maybe a lot of words that you guys have heard before. Uh, if not, just hang tight, we'll explain them. But this morning, we're talking about justification, that the moment we trust in Jesus, we are justified. 
And then week two, we're going to talk about uh, sanctification, that when we become a Christian, there's a process of us becoming more like Jesus. And then week three, we're talking about glorification, which is, hey, when this life is over, there will be one day when we are free from sin completely. And we are with, amen, that's what I'm talking about, right? One day, we will be completely glorified with our Savior. And so, uh, as you might have seen it on the video bump as well, but we are saved from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and the presence of sin. That's what we're talking about the series. Sound good? Yeah. Love it, all right. And so, this morning, justification, we'll be in Romans chapter three. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, it'll be on the screen. But Romans was written by Paul, and he is writing to a church in Rome that he's never been there. He's never actually met most of these believers, but they're doing great. Like he's heard rumors of them, and he's writing and saying, guys, keep it up. <laughs> like you're doing great. You're doing awesome things. I'm hearing about you from a thousand miles away. Like keep being unified. Keep sharing the gospel. Keep doing what you're doing. But he wrote specifically on the gospel, like more um, theology, more details. Hey, how, what does it look like that, you know, we're actually saved by Jesus? And he writes all about, I mean, 16 chapters, just all about the good news. But to have good news, what do you need first? Bad news, right? And we're going to start with some bad news. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Here's what it says. What then? Are we any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Paul himself, a Jewish man, that he realizes some Jews might think, all right, well, we're God's chosen people. We're doing all right. We, we got this thing figured out. He's like, eh, hmm, not so fast. Everybody, all are under sin. And to be under sin, it means that you are under God's wrath, that you have a penalty that you deserve to pay that we were created to be like God, to follow him, but we all do not do that perfectly by any means. We fall short. The Adam and Eve, they sinned, and everyone after them has wronged a holy, perfect ruler. And to prove this point, he strings together some Old Testament verses showing that the whole world, he says, all are under sin. He usually says, as it is written, so talking about Old Testament, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. He says all are under sin, the whole world, no one righteous. Do you think Paul's trying to prove a point here? Just in, just in case you missed it. Okay, here's what we got. No one, not even one, no one, uh, no one, all alike, all no one, not even one. Is there a common theme here? Anybody? Right? Everybody. All of us. You, 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 me. All of us. The entire world. No one is righteous. Not even one. No one is good. We've all turned away from God. And this word here, where it says no one righteous. Righteous is going to be a, a, a pretty important word this morning. Righteous or righteousness, it can mean right living. Like, okay, you are doing good things. Like, you are rightly living in a way that honors God. That's, that's part of it. But mainly and mostly, it refers to a right standing with God. So it's not necessarily about your behavior, but it's about your relationship, how you relate to a perfect, holy creator. That if you are righteous, that means nothing is standing in between you and God. But the problem is, who is righteous? Nobody, ain't nobody, all right? And he makes that very clear eight times just in these few verses. And uh, it gets worse. Don't worry. Their throat, this is describing the type of sin and describing us as sinners. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues. Viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift or eager to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths. In the path of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So I don't know if you caught that, but he's listing out like different 
uh, aspects of who we are, different parts of our body. He says, from our, mouth, from our mouth to our feet. Or that's a kind of symbolic way of saying, hey, head to toe, we're messed up. Way more than we could ever imagine. Not just our actions, but our attitudes. And it's not just that we're sin. You see here, there's like we are enslaved to it. That not only is it, hey, we do bad things, we want to do bad things. And then even the things that we don't want to do that are bad, what do we end up doing? But sometimes we end up doing them, right? Like he's not painting a very uh, wholesome picture of, of, of our hearts, of who we are. But this sin is a disease that you see infiltrates every aspect of our being. Our actions, our words, our thoughts, our relationships, everything. And you might read that, like we may have just gone through it and talking about, man, our words are viper's venom and um, we're eager to shed blood and ruin and wretchedness and all this stuff. And it's like, that sounds a bit harsh, right? Like that doesn't sound like me. I wouldn't describe myself that way. Or you know what? My neighbor's a pretty nice guy or my coworker. Yeah, she's lovely or not my baby. My kids are angels. Like this is not, this is not us. And if that's our thought, we probably don't understand how innately and internally wicked we really are. That it talks about, again, deceit and um, our words are viper's venom and there's ruin and wretchedness and there's no peace in us. Think about the things that we do. Like even a little white lie that we may go, okay, well, you know, it's not terrible. Like I'm not committing fraud, but yeah, I, I just lied a little bit. That lie, the Bible says, is deceitful. And the person who hears it, the person that you are deceiving, it is like poison to them, not only to, to your relationship, but it's hurting them. Or even if you hold on to um, bitterness and you refuse to forgive somebody, that is you bringing ruin into your relationship. That is you lacking peace. You're not putting it before you. You're saying, no, it, this is better that I deceive them and I lie and I hold on to this anger. Like the things that we do the Bible describes them as probably worse than we would view them. And the root reason for all of it is that there is no fear of God before their eyes. The, the, the truth of why we sin and how we sin and is because we don't recognize God, his role as judge of the universe. Verse 19 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, and whenever it refers to the law, okay, Paul's going to mention that quite a bit, uh, just think... Like Old Testament, God has given uh, his people lists of things that they should abide by or they should kind of follow or obey. You can kind of think the Ten Commandments, all right? Uh, have no other gods before me, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, those kind of things. The law, whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. So Paul says, hey, you can try to defend yourself. You go for it. You say, oh, I'm not that bad. God wouldn't really punish me for my small sins or whatever it is. But uh, basically Paul's saying, hey, you try to defend yourself, just shut up. <laughs> like every mouth may be shut. That we have no defense. We have no way to right our wrongs, to, to make it look better than it really is. We are under the judgment of God. When it comes down to it, the law, the things that I clearly have not followed in my life, it shuts me up because I have no ground to stand on. And not only is every person guilty, but we can't fix it. Verse 20, for no one will be justified in his sight, in God's sight, by the works of the law, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. All right, and so we've talked about um, righteousness, but this word justified is kind of our main word for the morning. To be justified, it means to a clear, to a clear, <laughs> means to clear or acquit of charges. That's part of it. But more directly, it means to declare righteous. So remember, righteous means to have a right standing with God. We remember that? I know we got a bunch of definitions, I know. But if to be righteous means to be right with God, justified means that you are declared righteous, 
you are considered to be on good standing or in good standing with God. And so he's saying no one will be made right with God by the works of the law. In other words, your behavior will not cut it. You trying to tip the scales of going, okay, well, maybe if I do more good than bad, God will just kind of forget the, the icky stuff and, you know, remember the gold stars that he gave me when I went to church and I prayed and I read my Bible. It's not going to work. He says, no one will be made right with God that way. And that's because the law, what God has given us, uh, it, it shows us who he is, but it also shows us how much we are like falling short of him. It shows us how we aren't like him. It brings, it exposes our inability to earn heaven, that we cannot be made right with God by how we live. And so the law, just think of the 10 commandments, the law is intended to reveal our sin, not heal our sin. Think about it this way. Um, Maybe some of you guys have had like a, went into the doctor's office or the hospital for like a MRI or a CAT scan before, all right? And I'm not medically inclined, so I'm going to speak kind of about this. Uh, but when I was a kid, I went in for one of those. I just remember they're the you know, big round donut looking things. And uh, the, the tech in there told me, I was like in elementary school, and she said, hey, just imagine you're going inside of a giant Cheerio. And I'm like, okay, that helps. <laughs> I don't know why, but it did. Anyway, uh, Let's, even for you, if you go in for an MRI, a CAT scan, they are trying to do what? They're trying to figure out what's going on in, in the inside so that you can get treatment, so that, you know, some plans can be made, doctor, anybody involved can get you better, right? That's the whole idea. If you were to go in for an MRI, a CAT scan, they scan you, you get back out, they tell you, hey, here's what's wrong. What you would not do is say, all right, doc, throw me back in the Cheerio and uh, heal me. No, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because that machine isn't meant to heal you. It's meant to reveal what's wrong with you. In the same way, the law is showing how incapable we really are. It's God did not give us rules to follow so that we can earn his love or be made righteous or be on good terms with him. We stand guilty before a perfect judge who we are accountable to at the end of our life, that God will place us in either heaven or hell for eternity. Bad news, because we're all guilty. He says no one is righteous, not even one. But enough of the bad news. Verse 21, the good news, but now, apart from the law, apart from your behavior, separated from what you can bring to the table, the righteousness of God or how you can be made right with him has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. And the law and the prophets, just a a way of saying the Old Testament. So he's saying, hey, God's way of bringing people to himself is accomplished apart from the law. We can't do it. It's not our behavior that gets the job done. The Old Testament was pointing to it, but now, Paul says, it's been revealed. We know the secret. We know how to do it. We know how to be on good terms with God. And how is that? Verse 22, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. It's not about what you can do. It's about having faith in the person who has done it all for us, about having faith in Jesus Christ. That is how we take possession. That is how we are made righteous. Jesus, through his life, his death, or his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, all the stuff that we've spent the last 36 weeks talking about, right, in the book of Luke, in that gospel, we've seen his life and what he offered and he is bringing offering salvation to the world. Jesus, when he came here, he revealed the righteousness of God. And it is only by our faith or our belief, our trust, our confidence that saves us. And it's not the faith itself. It's not, okay, well, I believe really, really, really hard. So that's why God lets me know. It's the object of our faith that saves us. 
It adds nothing to the gift that God offers itself. And we see how great this gift is. Romans 3.23, and this is probably the verse that most of us know in this passage. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we've all sinned. We don't meet the mark, but we are justified freely by God's grace. And it's through the redemption that's in Jesus. So we've done wrong. We've missed the mark. That sin separates us, but we can be made right by his grace. That God shows us kindness or he shows us favor. He loves us even though we do not deserve it. And he shows us that love through the redemption in Jesus. Redemption, it just means to, uh, to buy back or to set free by paying for something. And so if God is setting us free, what did it cost him? What was the payment? It was Jesus himself. It was the cost. It was the life of his son, Jesus, that he had to die for us to be made right with God. To save you, God offered the life of his son. And so if you ever want to know, like if you're ever maybe struggling with this or just we forget uh, how much God loves us, how, God, how much God loves you, we don't have to look any further than the cross. We can look at what God gave us, that he gave up his son so that you, a sinner, so that me, an imperfect person in rebellion to God can be made right with God. Verse 25 and 26. God presented Jesus as the mercy seat by his blood. Okay, so Paul has a lot of lingo. This almost reads more like a textbook than anything, right? But he says that Jesus was the mercy seat by his blood. And so real quick, the mercy seat that uh, in the Old Testament before Jesus God had set up this sacrificial system to atone or to deal with their sin. It was a temporary means until Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, got here. And so the, uh, the Jews in the Old Testament, they, they would have a temple. They would go sacrifice an animal, and uh, they would go to the mercy seat, which is where the, the presence of God dwelt, and they would sprinkle the blood on this mercy seat, and that would temporarily atone or cover for their sins. That sin could only be taken care of through the offering of blood. And that shows the severity of our sin and how much we need forgiven. We need a system for it. So that's what he's talking about here. But Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, Jesus was that mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Verse 26, God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and justify the one who has faith in Jesus. So by doing this, it says that God is both just and the justifier. And what Paul means by that is that God doesn't just ignore our sin. All right, I, maybe this is what some of us think thinks that, that happens when we become a Christian, that we say, I'm sorry, God. And he goes, oh, you forget about it, man. Come on up to heaven. Like, it's not just a forgive and forget that our sin is so serious and God is so perfect as the perfect judge, he must punish sin. And so if that's the case, Somebody's got to pay that penalty. And in this instance, Paul's saying, Jesus did that. Instead of me paying the death penalty, Jesus took it upon himself. When we put our faith in Jesus, that he took our place, that he paid our death penalty, and we are immediately justified. We are declared righteous. We are made right with God when we put our faith in Jesus. We are justified, and that's where this word justification, all right, is where it comes from, what we're talking about. That in a moment, all right, justification, this, this idea that, hey, we're made right with God, it isn't like, all right, well, I put my faith in Jesus, but then I really had to kind of step up my game and clean up my life before God accepted me. 
This happens in a moment. The second that we trust in Jesus, that we put our faith in him, we are justified. This is not a process, but it's an act. And to be justified doesn't mean that God fixes your behavior. It means he fixes how you relate to him. You are made right that no longer, Romans goes on later to say, no longer are you an enemy of God. But when you're justified, you are made a son or daughter of God, which is a big difference. I mean, that, that truth, think about what that means for us. Think about what that actually, like, I'll just use me for an example, all right? I, uh, I've spent 30 years living, and I haven't tried to do everything wrong or terribly, but I have definitely failed <laughs> to live it all right. Like, I am a sinner. I am a lawbreaker. I have broken God's commands time after time. And I have had a life filled with breaking God's laws. I have been lazy. I have been angry. And I've held on to resentment against people because I thought that's what they deserved. I've been fixated on how, okay, well, I think I did more work than them and they did less than me, so I should get more credit than them. I've been jealous of others. I've stolen things that don't belong to me. I've had lust in my heart. I've spent 10 years of my life previously addicted to pornography. I've been prideful where I've thought, okay, no, it's all about me, myself, and I. I've had selfish motives that involved elevating me. I've been harsh to people. I've lied. I've not kept my word. I've not kept my commitment. I've been anxious and fearful and refused to give things to God. I am a sinner. And most of those things I've done hundreds, maybe thousands of times. But because I believe that Jesus lived a perfect life, he had no sin, he was completely righteous. And he was willingly the perfect sacrifice to cover my sins and pay my death penalty. Because my faith is in him, All those things are true of me, but now what's true ultimately is that I am no longer guilty, that I no longer have to pay the penalty for the wrong that I have done in my life. I am justified. I am declared righteous. Do I deserve it? Nah, (laughs) not even in the smallest degree. I do not deserve any grace that God gives me. But God loves us and he chooses to show that kindness to us. And so I don't know everyone's life details. I don't know all of you personally, but I do know that you're a sinner just like me, right? And I know that you can fill in the blank with whatever you want, whatever you've done, whatever your past consists of, that God is able to forgive. That some of you, uh, maybe we walked in this room like, kind of on both ends of the spectrum. Some of us think that, okay, well, I can earn my way to God. I can follow the law. I can be a good enough person or kind of just make God happy with me and, and, and I'll be good. But Paul says, no, apart from the law, that's how we are made righteous. And some of us may think the complete opposite, that we're thinking God could never forgive me. Like, Okay, Michael, that sounds all great, but you don't know what I've said. You don't know how I've treated people. You don't know the things that I've done, the the shame and the guilt and the anger that I hold on to because of those things. I don't know that. But if you are sitting here thinking that God cannot save you, that God cannot forgive you because of your sin, I want to lovingly tell you that you are believing a lie, that God is able to forgive us because the death of of Jesus is sufficient to cover your mistakes. This is what he does. And if we were to get this, like if we were to grasp onto this truth and realize, all right, we are no longer guilty, but we are declared righteous. Like what would change for us? Knowing that the most important person in the universe, that when we end our life, we will ultimately stand before God and give an account for everything that we did. The person that we are accountable to the one that has a greater and more important view than anybody else on this earth or in this world, he has the final say. If he looks at us 
if our faith is in Jesus and says, yeah, you're good, you're justified, you are declared righteous, what if we got that? Because that means whenever you have thoughts of, okay, well, I'm no good, or I've messed up and God can't use me, or I'm too far gone, or yeah, my sin's too bad, we have to weigh what we think and compare it to what God thinks. And God's opinion of us is way more important than our opinion of ourselves. That he says we are holy and blameless before him. That no other opinion matters. And so we don't have to look to others to get our approval. It's not about the things that we do. Our life isn't built on achievements and goals and look what I can do and look what I can accumulate and all these things. No, it's God has already spoken on me. God has already declared, considered that I am righteous, that I am made right with him. But that's only if I accept the grace that he offers. I'll, uh, I'll end with this. There's a, there's a guy, his name was George Wilson. All right, you can go and look this up for yourself. But uh, George Wilson lived in uh, the ninth, whoa, 1820s, 1829 to be specific. George Wilson got together with some, with some buddies and they decided to rob a mail carrier. All right, and they, uh, they were caught, they were tried, and ultimately they were charged with a couple things. One was obstructing and robbing the mail, and two was putting the life of the carrier at risk. So they were jeopardizing that guy's life. And they were both, um, I think there were three guys in there, but George and another one, two of them were sentenced to death. They were given the death penalty, and it was hanging over their heads. And his friend actually was hanged, that he was, he paid for his mistakes. He paid the penalty. But George, for some reason, I don't exactly know how or, or why, but he had some friends that either they had some connections to some higher up people or they just made that big of a ruckus, I don't know. But they got the attention of Andrew Jackson, aka the President of the United States. And his friends were like, hey, Andy, can, uh, can you offer our friend George a presidential pardon? He's a nice guy, you know, like he doesn't really deserve this. Can you make sure he doesn't die? And for whatever reason, Andrew Jackson said, yeah, I'll do it. And so he writes out and issues a presidential pardon to George Wilson or for him. And it didn't take care of all of his charges. Like he still would have had to um, spend like 20 years in jail. But the death penalty was taken away. That he says, hey, you're pardoned. You no longer have this, you know, looming over your head. And so they're in court and uh, George Wilson is there and they tell him, hey, you've been given a pardon. Death penalty wiped away. And George Wilson does something strange that catches everyone off guard. He says, I don't want it. He turns it down. And we... Don't exactly know why. Maybe it was like, yeah, Andrew Jackson, you can keep your $20 and I don't need your help. And you know, like maybe it was stick it to the man or there was some legal kind of legal, legal <laughs> mumbo jumbo that maybe it's actually better and I can work out a deal. I don't know. Either way, he turned it down and he told them like, I, I don't want to reap the benefits of that pardon. And it caught everyone off guard. Uh, I was reading that actually the court was divided. They were like, wait a minute, can, can he do that? <laughs> like, is that even possible? You know, can he turn down something the president says is true of him? And uh, they were divided and shocked. So it was like some of them thought, yeah, well, I mean, he's a grown man. He can make his own choices. So yeah, let him, you know, let him pay. But then others were like, but it's the president. You know what I mean? Like he's telling him what to do. And uh, either way, it, ran up the courts, and the Supreme Court decided on it. And here's what they said. It says, a pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential and delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered. And if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it on him. So they're saying the president can go out of his way to write a pardon, to remove the death penalty, to offer this act of grace. 
but it's not effective. It has no power unless the person accepts it, unless the person receives it. And it doesn't benefit them unless they say, yeah, I want that to be applied to me. That is true of, that was true of George Wilson. And the same is true for us. That God can make a way through his son, Jesus, who pardons us from our death penalty, who died on the cross to pay for our sin. That only applies to us if we accept it. That Jesus died for the whole world, but he's not your savior unless you trust in him. Unless you say, yeah, God, I am a sinner. I do need that pardon. I do need your grace. And I trust in you. And I put my faith in you. And I accept that gift. It's only beneficial unless you accept it. By faith. Have you accepted it? A lot of us may think, okay, like a... Like I said earlier, we walk in thinking that I can do this on my own or yeah, I believe in God and that'll get me through. No, have you accepted that you need a savior, that God has made a way for you to be forgiven and have you trusted in that and have you committed your life to follow him? That because of Jesus, what he's offering to all of us, because of Jesus, God treats people as if they were completely sinless. And that announcement, him declaring us righteous, that will never be repealed, that will never be taken away, that is once and for all, even when this life is over and we are face to face with God and my eternity is in front of me, my confidence is not in God, I worked so hard for you, I did this and that. My confidence is in the blood of Jesus that he took my penalty so that I could be made right with you. I am justified through your son, Jesus. And starting today, we can have the confidence, we can have the assurance, we can know 100% that the sin that condemns me was nailed to the cross and Jesus took care of it. And that's what he's offering to all of us today. If you haven't made that decision, don't wait. God's made a way for you to fulfill your life purpose and have a relationship with him. And for those of us who have made that decision, walk in that. Remember the confidence that you have that our identity is built in God and not us because everything, our sin, our wrongdoing, our mistakes, like I said, that was nailed to the cross. Let's pray and, um, and thank God for it. God, we are so grateful for who you are. I mean, God, think about just you, your character, that you are loving, that you show us grace. We do not deserve it. Anything in every, like every aspect of our life, God, we are sinful. We are rebels. We have gone against your word. And even though that's true, God, you offer life. You offer forgiveness. And you had to punish our sin and that sin, that wrath that we deserve has been taken out on Jesus. But it's only true of those of us who have put our faith in him. And I pray that you would uh, convict us, those who have not been made right with you. God, if we are walking around living this life um, and our eternity is not secure, I pray that you would uh, grab their hearts. And those of us who have, God, help us to walk in that confidence that we don't have to wonder day to day, am I saved, am I not, am I good enough today, am I, uh, maybe I'll do better tomorrow. God, we are justified. And that is true of us today and that will be true of us a million years from now. And that's only because of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.